Okay, I think we've got enough uh, <laughs> enough people here. We'll go ahead and start the meeting. <laughs> Welcome everyone to our uh, fourth Zoom meeting. And uh, once again, the flag is in the room. And we'll start off with the uh, four-way test of the thing. We think, say, and do. First, is it the truth? Second, is it third? Third. Third. Will it build goodwill and better friendships? And fourth, is it beneficial to all concerned? Okay. Now, for a rotary moment, sadly, I would like to ask us all to pause for a moment in remembrance of Karen Carlson's father who passed away uh, in the past week. Uh, Fred's oh. no longer with us, so I'd, I'd just like everybody to take a moment of silence and, uh, and prayers for the Carlson family as they are uh, going through this period. So let us just uh, pray for just a moment, silent, silently. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, announcements. We uh, delivered our shields that uh, were produced and let me get down here. Hey, Mohan. Where did it go? Well, you going to share a photo? I was going to share a photo. Gary, why don't you do it? Because I. Well, that means I got to go find the phone. Oh, there, there you right. where, where are you going? Oh. Well, I'm, I thought I had it uh, there, but I'm going to stop share. Anyway, there were five of us there uh, yesterday to deliver the uh, the shields at the uh, Orange County Global Medical Center on T North Tustin Avenue. And there were Gary, yeah, I'll, I'll uh, send I'll. Larry, Johnny, and myself. Yeah, I'll I'll share the uh, as soon as I find it here. Okay, and just uh, to acknowledge, that three of us who were there uh, shouldn't have been there. We <laughs> we were not supposed to be out and about in this uh, arena right now, but we were there and uh, we did the club proud. They were very happy to receive them and they were happy people and uh, Roger thanks for the referral and uh, getting us to the right place to, to folks in our own community that we can use them effectively. How many did we do again? We had 500 that we delivered. Nice. There was a and, total of and also just as uh, there we go. Oh I'm sharing the wrong screen. <laughs> Am I sharing the right screen? Oh, yeah. Well, that's so. the pictures, yeah. Yeah, okay, good. And uh, and just for information, I know that Larry's not on with us right now, but uh, Larry had himself, took himself a tumble, and uh, he looked like he should have stayed in the hospital when he came yesterday, or on Tuesday. He uh, got himself pretty banged up when he uh, fell down, was it a flight of stairs, Gary? Yeah, he said he was, uh, I guess, up in his office, and then he came down the stairs and, and went face first down the stairs. Yeah. Oh, my yeah, God. Yeah, that's so Wow. He got himself banged up pretty good. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's, uh, that's really the only announcement that I have. Do we have any other announcements uh, for the club? I think that's it. Yeah. Well, the social activities are po po postponed at least until June. Yeah, I think so. I think we're gonna. I think we're gonna finish out my year on Zoom the way it's looking right now. <laughs> I may start mine too. <laughs> well, it sounds like we're gonna finish out your year with some some good speakers on Zoom. So yeah, we're doing okay. And in, in fact, we've got a great day. So I think it's time to introduce our speaker for today, our own Greg Franklin. Franklin, to talk to us about what the school district. Did has done, is doing, and will do in the future. Greg, over to you. Thanks, Dick. Hi, everybody. Hi. 
Hey. Hey. I agree with uh, Fred. I, I think these Zoom meetings, sometimes I have trouble getting over to the, the in-person meeting, but this is quite convenient, so good idea. Hey, um, the school district's moving along, and uh, kids are online every day for the most part, and uh, there are some options for kids who, uh, for one reason or another, either can't or the parents have concerns about the kids being online. We do have some paper and pencil options for kids. But uh, if you figure that on August or uh, March, let's see, Jonathan might help me. March 16th, I think, was our school board meeting, which was the first Monday of our spring break. Uh, we decided at that point that we would not return from spring break and we would start doing distance learning. In the next six days, we put together an entire uh, process so that we trained teachers on the first Monday they were back from spring break and on Tuesday they started teaching. And uh, it's just an incredible testament to the, the quality of the leadership in the Ed Services Division, as well as all the teachers and principals, assistant principals, people really uh, rallied around to try and make that happen on very, very short order. And obviously we would not have been able to do that had it not been for Measure S back in 2012. If you've been in the district a while, you know that we had a technology bond that put uh, technology in the hands of every student every day from fifth grade to 12th grade. So all of our fifth graders through eighth graders have a iPod or an iPad checked out to them like a textbook. They put it in their bag, they take it home every day, it comes to class with them every day. And at the high school level, the kids all have a uh, laptop. We uh, bought new Surface Pros this year. They previously had a, a different brand, Toshiba. So all the kids, fifth through 12th, already had one-on-one uh, -on -one technology. And then any of the K through fourth grade kids that needed technology, we checked out uh, additional iPads. And uh, our schools, our IT department, our librarians, the people who um, did the checking out, put together these processes that within the first couple of days after spring break, every kid had a device. And probably within a week and a half, even kids that didn't have internet, uh, our IT department was able to help them uh, either get an internet connection through one of the local carriers, or we would issue them for, them, uh, for their use. So uh, all of that went pretty incredibly well when you think the short turnaround and um, the scale of it uh, was, was pretty impressive. Um, I do want to mention that Governor Newsom in his executive order said that he's going to, um, that if schools close because of health concerns, which is what we did, and it was a local decision, the governor has to close schools, the governor is making these recommendations about social distancing and staying home but it's up to each school board to decide whether or not to close. Um, when he did that, he also said that schools would um, continue to get funding based on, not on our, enroll, or on our attendance like we normally do, but he froze our um, funding, which is a good thing, and said, however you were funded in January, February, we're gonna fund you through the end of the year um, for that same amount. And school districts were not allowed to take anybody off of our payrolls. So the governor is using the funds that flow to schools to keep money fl flowing through the economy to some degree. So um, all employees feel very, very fortunate to be in that boat. And so while everybody's getting paid, many people are working from home as much as possible. Our nutrition services folks uh, are still working because we're feeding kids. We call it grab and go. I think on a daily basis, on the Monday, Tuesday, Thursday that we do serve food, we're serving close to 3,000 meals uh, each of those days. And families pull up, they pop their trunk, we put the meals into the trunk so that there's no or very little interaction and chance of uh, cross infection. And so the families are pretty grateful. Our nutrition services folks are doing that gladly. Um, I go around and thank them from time to time I was at the, the sites today, and as one of the food service workers said, kids gotta eat, and uh, they feel good about being able to fulfill that mission. The other people in the district that are working uh, boots on the ground, our IT department, 
continues to work and maintain our network. If you think about a, an IT network, um, the people who manage the network spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to keep people from the outside off the network, right? So that you can protect it and lock it down. Well, now everybody's out of the network and we've got to let people in. And so there, it creates a whole new kind of complexity for our IT folks to manage all of the access that's happening from homes uh, into the, the internet, um, our, our local connection. So they, they continue to show up. Uh, they rotate and stay at home as much as possible, trying to uh, honor the governor's shelter at home um, executive order. But we are considered an essential service. And so we bring in the people we need to make sure that the work can continue. Then the final area of people that we have continuing to work are security, um, campus supervisors to maintain the safety of the campuses and some of our m and guys. So we're still doing work orders. We're doing some of the, the work that would normally happen over the summer. We're doing some of that. And uh, those guys are working, uh, following social distancing guidelines and wearing the personal uh, protective equipment. Uh, the teaching and learning that's going on, it's a little bit different at the elementary level than the middle school level and the high school level. But here are some common, um, common themes. Uh, all of it virtual. We're not doing any face-to-face -face meetings um, unless it's over a computer. Um, most of our teachers are meeting with their classes uh, at least uh, two to four times a week. And uh, especially at the elementary school, we're finding that that's very, very important for the kids to maintain a connection to a teacher and their school. Um, we're also learning about the kids' parents and their sisters and brothers and their pets. And um, it, it's taken on a whole new life of its own. But so those, those live meetings, sort of like we're doing now. So at a given time, everybody will get on and have this, this meeting. Uh, other components of the instruction, the teachers will do some direct lessons. Those are generally video recorded so that then the kids can access them online uh, under whatever calendar or schedule works best for their family. And uh, I don't think it's a surprise to any of you, but you know, we, we have such a wide range of families, uh, demographics, wealth, poverty, um, living conditions. And so while some of us think, well, it's no big deal. I'm home, the kids are home, I'll help them with the homework. That is certainly not true for a, a good number of our families. And so, um, in addition then to having those video recordings, the teachers are also doing something we call office hours. So on a daily basis, they have a couple of hours during the day where they say they're available and you can um, zoom in. We don't actually use Zoom, we use Google Meeting uh, because we're a big Google anyway and we had some uh, security concerns about Zoom early on. And Google Meet has worked out really well for us. Um, Grading is an issue. Uh, when, this, when everybody started closing schools, uh, there was some directives from the, Orange, or the California Department of Education that said, well, if you're gonna close your schools, and we recognize that every school in the state is closed except for one elementary school in Tulare County. And um, their, their guidance was, do no harm uh, to the students. So the students should not pay the price for having difficulty logging in, whether they have problems with access to technology or the internet, or they don't have support at home through a parent or an older sibling. It, it, the kids should not be uh, bear the brunt of their uh, situation. So most school districts have done a variation of the theme that we've done, which is to say, when we, when we left for spring break, that was the end of our third quarter for our middle schools and high schools. Our elementary kids are on a uh, trimester, so they had made it through um, two trimesters plus a little bit of the third. And so at the high school level is the only place where we're actually issuing grades. And uh, the minimum grade a kid can earn is whatever they had in the third quarter. So they have a chance to raise that grade or they can also um, take pass or incomplete. And I, I said it backwards. The, the default is in our high schools, Everybody that has a, a D or higher pass, 
If you have an F, then you get an incomplete. We're going to work with the kids through the summer and next fall uh, to be able to, to finish that up. The purpose of that is we recognize not every kid's able to do that work at this point. And uh, hopefully in the summer and the fall, we'll, we'll have better access to the kids and be able to help them. A student may, uh, by the end of the school year, request a letter grade. And uh, we have a form and a process for that to happen. So some kids will get letter grades, but only if they request them and only for those courses that they make that request of. And so that's, that's the grading. That's kind of referred to as the, the blended student model. Some districts are going only credit, no credit. Other districts are giving grades like they've always given grades. Um, but I think in Orange County, this is probably the, the predominant method. Right now, um, our board has met a couple of times virtually since we've uh, initially closed the schools and we've extended our closure through the end of the school year. So that goes to May 28th was our last day of school. And um, of course, there's all kinds of end of the year kinds of activities that we typically plan at schools. So right now, sites, teachers, principals, with support from the district administration are working on some virtual celebrations awards uh, activities, promotional activities for fifth graders and eighth graders, um, but none of it in person. It'll all take place uh, in one form or fashion, you know, like we're doing today. The exception to that is high school graduation. Talking to our kids, our, 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 of course our site folks have tremendous relationships with kids, so they've been talking to them a lot about what do you think of graduation? And the kids were very anxious to have an in-person graduation, even if it weren't held at the end of May. And so we've uh, settled on three dates uh, for our five high schools that'll take place uh, August 4th, 5th, and 6th. And so just if, if you're going five, how'd you get five schools? We have um, our three comprehensive high schools. We'll graduate in, uh, the Tustin High football field, if we're able, and that's Foothill, Beckman, and Tustin. And then we also have Hillview, our continuation high school. But remember, we also have now Connect High School, which is our online school. And they're kind of looking around going, what's the big deal? This is cool. <laughs> and so they're, they're doing quite well, and uh, they will have a graduation in the Beckman Auditorium. Our commitment at that point is, uh, to do it in person if we're able, but we're not going to do it in person in violation of any of the governor's social distancing guidelines that are in place at that time. So we have sort of a, a dual path that we're preparing. Uh, we're going to start go ahead and start doing a virtual graduation ceremony and start collecting all the information and uh, uh, video and photos and, and all the things that we would need to be able to do that but we're gonna hold out hope of being able to at least bring the kids together for an in-person graduation, even if there aren't family and friends in the stands. And then we would be able to live stream that. If the social guidelines are in place at the time where we could have 3,000 people together, then you know, we'll just do a regular graduation. Uh, but based on the trends so far, I, I'm guessing that that's um, probably a remote hope. Um, Summer school, uh, typically we run a very small elementary and middle school summer school just for those kids that need particular help. Um, but right now, those are the kids that we have the most trouble actually reaching and getting a hold of. So we're not gonna try and do a virtual summer school uh, at the elementary and middle school level this summer, but we are doing a high school summer school and that's that will be held virtually. So, um, Eight, it's about eight o'clock in the morning to one o'clock. It'll have more structure and rigor um, in it than, than what we've been doing for these last few weeks and uh, help those kids uh, either get ahead in their course schedule or remediate a class that they haven't passed in the past. So that's typically who takes the high school, summer school classes. And we return to school on August 13th uh, is the plan. We, we actually have just started talking to our uh, associations about the idea of coming back to school later. You know, what if, what if the social restrictions eased up by September 1st? 
why would we want to start school on the 13th under more restrictions when we could just wait maybe until September? Of course, that all was moving forward. And then the governor throws a curveball out of left field uh, yesterday about, hey, maybe we should start school in July. And uh, you may have, if you've heard that and watched the reaction, it's not been pleasant. So I don't really expect anybody to start school in July. Although um, everybody understands the governor's interest in creating sort of a childcare solution so we can start getting people back to work. And we recognize that school has a big role in that, uh, sort of a custodial um, role and responsibility. I really think... Um, we're more likely to start, we're definitely more likely to start on August 13th than any time in July. And I think there's still a chance we could start after um, Labor Day uh, in September. That of course requires bargaining with our uh, teachers association and our classified um, labor union. Um, so it's a, a possibility, but the only reason to do that is if we thought that the the guidance or the um, the distancing restrictions would be less, right, by starting in September than they would be in mid-August. Otherwise, there's no real reason to do that. The sooner we can get kids back in class, the better. But uh, uh, if you wanted to watch like a Laurel and Hardy skit, but not, talk to teachers and principals about how you bring kids back to school and maintain social distancing. You know, it's like kindergartners are like puppies, you know, they're just falling all over each other all the time. So um, I don't see us coming back and starting school in a way that uh, has social distancing as much of the plan. There, there might be some restrictions like no assemblies. Uh, the CIF Athletic Association is talking about starting school, but not starting sports until the social distance guidelines have been uh, all but eliminated. We could even see a football season that starts in January, uh, would not surprise me, um, with the fall sports actually moving back to winter and running winter sports and fall sports at the same time. So everybody's interested in getting kids back. Nobody wants to bring the kids back and put teachers or, or kids or the kids' families at risk. So um, that bringing people back, there's a lot of conflicting interests. Doing it sooner to help parents uh, get back to work, doing it sooner to recover the learning that's been lost, but not doing it so soon that um, either we can't keep the social distance or um, safety for the kids and the staff. So I talked pretty fast and covered a lot of bases. I thought that I would give you that kind of an overview um, and I just have to say again, uh, the staff has been phenomenal. Um, and our directions to teachers were relationships over content, make sure kids and families are okay, but be connected with, with the kids and uh, not just teachers, but our paraeducators, our secretaries, of course, our principals are always fantastic. People have been reaching out to kids on a daily basis, making phone calls if we don't hear from them, getting logged in, uh, solving issues, as I mentioned, about connectivity, even helping with, uh, with uh, IT issues that typically would be beyond us, but our folks know how to help the families navigate through those bureaucracies. Hey, Gary. All right. So and, and by the way, the protocol, I think, should be we raise our hands and uh, Greg can call us out. And, um, but I have a question for you. So what, what keeps you up at night right now? What's the thing that is the most you know, stressful part of what you're doing uh, that, that you're worried the most about? Is there one particular thing? Yeah, I think that the, the coming back on August 13th, and... Um, I have a couple of concerns about that. So number one concern is able to and provide for everybody's safety uh, in doing that. Number two, even if we think we can, what do we do for the families of kids who the families don't think we can? Mm -hmm. So I can envision a time where we say, hey, school's open, send your kids. And some families going, well, I, I still see COVID cases happening in the Orange County Register and 
uh, the Orange County Health Agency, I'm not going to send my kids. So we're working pretty hard right now at saying, one, what does school look like? And that has several different scenarios because it might be, for example, if they say open school, but you can't have more than 10 or 15 kids in a classroom. Well, we don't have the budget to all of a sudden hire a bunch of new teachers and reduce the class size. What would school look like? It would probably look like an every other day attendance. So a third grade teacher, I see 15 of my third graders today and we spend a day doing school and then tomorrow they stay home and the other 15 come to class. <laughs> same lesson. So that's the kind of scenario planning that we're doing about next year just for school, right? That's just, that was, that will be what school looks like. And then the other scenario is school's open and that's what we're doing, but some people still don't want to send their kids. What do we provide for those families in way of sort of an independent study program? And I think um, one of the things that we're, we're also preparing for is our, our online school. We expect the enrollment will go up because some families will just opt for that. And which is why, and I, I see Jonathan and Lori in the corner of my, my screen, you're right up there. Um, nominal in pushing for options for families well before COVID. So we have the dual language uh, immersion program. We have the online K-12 school. We have the science and STEM magnet academy. We have all these different programs available so that there's something for, uh, for kids and families to choose from. Hi, uh, yes. Uh, oh, yeah. I just want to say to, um, thank you, because uh, as I've said before, I've known just about every principal superintendent in this district over many, many years, and I think Greg is by far the, the absolute best. And we have friends, you know, Kathy was a teacher. We have friends that are teachers. We have friends, a friend that's a principal, and, it, and those people are absolutely remarkable because, you know, I'm not a teacher, but Kathy's standing here. She can tell you, you know, your analogy of the uh, kindergartners being like puppies. <laughs> yeah. What about teenagers in middle school with all the hormones and crap going on? They're more like rabbits, Carl. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. So anyway, that's why I just want to say thank you. Thank you, Carl. Yes, Dick's wife. <laughs> okay. He, he Dick muted me. I can't even imagine the the breadth of all of your challenges. But uh, this morning, my um, daughter in law was here with our two little grandchildren, and they're from um, Portola Portola Rancho Santa Margarita area. And she was saying in the elementary school they're trying these virtual classes, but the biggest challenge seems to be. The, the parents helping the children. So she's starting a, a group. She's a techie person and has worked for years in high tech and has been laid off. So she's gonna start a parent education course so they can use uh, technology and, and help their young children. But she sees that as a big challenge. One of the silver linings maybe of all of this is um, and, and Tustin's been very good about technology since 2012. As I mentioned, Measure S passed. We had uh, devices in the hands of the kids by 2013. But um, not 100% usage. You know, we still have teachers who are less techie than other teachers. Well, now everybody knows how to use it. And uh, it's pretty incredible. I, I would imagine that tech, teaching and learning, when we do come back, will never look the same. And, uh, I think that's probably a good thing. Bill's here. Hi, Bill. Uh, Bill's, uh, if you haven't met him, he's, um, uh, gosh, what's your title? An engineering teacher? You're, you used, uh, you we up? renamed the class to Engineering Design and Fabrication, and so which is that, really what Woodshop has been doing for a million years anyway. So I just formalized the title. Maybe you um, want to talk but, very briefly about your experience? Yeah, I, um, being CTE, 
I have zero experience with online uh, platforms, but the testing side, you know, in at U's middle school where I teach, all the kids have iPads given by the district, and most of the teachers have Google Classroom uh, that it, they've been putting lessons on for um, for years, and so um, it was really easy for us to um, move to this online platform. It it already existed, so. Uh, we didn't have to really reinvent the wheel. For me, it was a little different because I'm, you know, a project-based class. And uh, so I had a steep learning curve, but it's going great. Uh, the district is giving us tutorials and resources. And I certainly on my site that I can um, email and um, meet like we're doing here. But I'll just say one last thing is my brother is uh, an English teacher in the Fontana Unified School District. And he told me um, he's got about 5% of his kids doing the online learning, turning in assignments. And I can't speak for you uh, in general, but I can speak for me. I, you know, I've got 95% of my kids turning in assignments, asking questions, sending me emails. And uh, so it's, um, you know, the district was set up for this, not knowing this would happen. And I just know, cause we meet as teachers and we have staff meetings and things. We're all anxious to um, get back in the classroom cause that social emotional side of teaching is so important for the kids, uh, not only to socialize with each other, but just to have another adult sending them probably the same messages their parents are um, and that dynamic of learning in, in person I think will be confirmed to be as or more important after this pandemic than it was before and I'm sure many of the parents can speak um, to you know what the teachers have to do on a daily basis so I commend Tustin Unified this is my second year with the district and um, you know I hate to say it was a great experience because I really miss my students, but I just recorded videos today because um, we have our award ceremonies and you know, we're trying to keep things as normal as possible. So thanks to, to Greg and the principals, you know, really a lot of support for our teachers. So I thank you. Those comments, Bill, and I, I think, uh, cause I, I'm talking to teachers every day that echoes pretty closely people's experience. So you can tell the positive upbeat, can do attitude that the the staff approaches it with the kids reciprocate back and so it's been very good uh, one other thing that keeps us up late at night um, what, to answer one other piece of it is the budget you know we had the great recession of 2008 and 9 and then it took us years to recover from that and so uh, right now we're spending additional resources to do this distance learning at a time when we're about to have budgets uh, greatly reduced because of the recession that's coming. So it'll be interesting to see um, how fast that drop happens uh, just for managing the money, but also the mental health kids uh, needs of families and kids skyrocketed during that last 2008 and nine recession. And we've never really recovered from that. The, the amount of anxiety in families and kids has remained relatively high, even as the economy recovered. So with this second uh, recession wave, I think that Bill hit it right on the head, that, that social emotional um, recovery will be as important as the financial. Can I answer any other questions? Hi, Josie. Speak to the resources. Um, that the teachers are being provided to help them be more engaging. And, and I get it from my own experience. My son's in high school, and I notice some teachers are really good with this distance learning, and some of them I'm just like, my son's going to struggle next year, and I don't know how prepared he's going to be with college if I can't get a more engaging lesson plan. And I know this kind of sprung on them yeah. out of nowhere, but I'm thinking about for next year if we see another – increase towards the fall and maybe we have to go back to stay at home are teachers going to be given the resources to be better at doing online 
teaching? Yes. Um, not, not all teachers are created equal. We know mm -hmm. we yeah. recognize that because you said that some of your kids' teachers are very engaging and doing a great job. So I would tell you they have the resources now. Okay. What they don't have is either the skill or the inclination. Mm. And so um, our principals, one of our rules in the school district is every teacher gets a visit every week from a principal or assistant principal so that we can mm. monitor instruction, just stay connected to the teaching and learning that's going on in classrooms. And so during this distance learning, the expectation is the same. And we, we've had several meetings with principals about it. The principals should be dropping into those Google classrooms when teachers are live with kids. Okay. And, uh, checking on the, the homework sheets and uh, what kind of work is being expected and assigned. Um, so we have systems of monitoring like that. But we also recognize that, well, teachers, if I'm a teacher with three kids between the ages of three and eight, maybe, and my kids are home and I'm supposed to work, mm -hmm. uh, we recognize and we, we explicitly told our teachers, um, we do not expect you to work every day between three or eight and three. Um, that's why I mentioned you're going to have some video lessons, you're going to have some office hours, you're going to do some class meetings, because we recognize this is, this is a worldwide pandemic. Right. We're, we're not going to expect things to continue as they always have. For the fall, we also recognize that this would be insufficient to come back to the fall under this model. Mm -hmm. And so um, when I mentioned scenario planning, um, one of the things that we, we want to have scenarios for is if we, let's say we are able to return and August 13th happens, kids come back, teachers come back, and now we have a case, a COVID case, either of a staff or a student. And then what do we do? You know, and how long right. does school close? Or does it only that classroom that has to close? <laughs> so we need a lot of guidance from the health professionals as well. Um, but if we have to return to distance learning, the, the rigor is going to have to be bumped up. <laughs> So we're working okay. with an online company to provide the shell of the class, and then the teachers can supplement um, and even substitute out some of the lessons and, and uh, assignments. That would create a more consistent uh, learning experience for kids, regardless of who their teacher was. That's good. And then I do have a follow-up question about the grades. Um, and I don't know if there's going to be another uh, email that goes out about it. Um, if we select a letter grade being in high school, but then some classes you obviously like you can't do letter grades or whatnot. Like my son's in T-Tech. It's very difficult to do projects now because they're not in the shop. Mm -hmm. um, so is there going to be communication as to a GPA calculation or is that something we should just go to wait for the counselor to reach out to us and tell us how that's going to be calculated? Yeah, you can do the calculation, although the counselors can help you. But a, a class that's taken credit or incomplete mm -hmm. doesn't count as a class. So okay. normally you'd add up your grade points and then divide by the number of classes. Yes. Well, when you divide by the number of classes, you just subtract those classes that you took credit in. Okay, so that's not going to count as a zero and bring the average down. You just won't count it at all. Correct. Okay, then that's good to know. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Jamie. Okay, I got a follow-up question too. Jamie, um, Jamie so how likely do you think that like alternate scheduling is like on your scenario list as far as an every other day or a morning afternoon? Are you guys putting real energy behind those alternate schedules or you think those are less likely to happen i watch the governor's news <laughs> news press releases just like you do i i yeah. don't have any i don't have any sense the only thing that i i am getting the sense of that i think will help us he really wants people to be able to go back to work yeah and everybody recognizes for that to happen the kids have to go to school yeah so I think we'll be back at school on August 13th. Mm -hmm. I have no way of projecting what the social distancing guidelines will be at that point. Yeah. Okay. It, you know, for us, we're planning 
because we plan when you guys are out of school. So your scheduling really dictates yeah. my scheduling. So it's, Jimmy, I'm trying, I'm, I'm struggling with planning as, you know, as well. Yeah. They you know, and us, Jamie, never feel bad about calling me or Grant yeah. or Mark. Um, okay. Yeah, we, okay. we welcome the conversations. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Gary? First of all, I just wanted to congratulate you on how well it has gone considering all the unknowns that have occurred. I mean, I, from from my point of view as a parent, you know, I've, I've got a kid in fourth grade and another kid in seventh grade, and they have assimilated into this rhythm of school that I just never thought that they would actually get into that. Yeah. And, you know, it is, you know, the fourth grader, it's like, it's like the puppies thing, except it's an online puppies thing because they're, they're still all over each other. And they still, you know, she got in trouble the other day, I guess the equivalent of some kind of a, a you know, a, a slip to go to the principal online by having side conversations inside the classroom through texting, through their, you know, side texting. And so, but it's all viewable by the teacher so they can see the conversation that's going on. So of course then she gets in trouble. And, and uh, uh, so she's being very creative with the tech, using technology. And then the, the, the seventh grader, he seems to be really into the rhythm of set by the teachers for, for learning. He, he has, uh, uh, you know, he knows what he has to do each day. He's, he knows when he has to check in with the teacher. He knows when he needs to get done. And then he is actually spending a lot of time um, with other kids in his class that maybe don't understand whatever the thing is. He's actually doing the tutoring too. And there's, encouraging the teachers are encouraging this to happen and i think it's really great for the ages that can actually do that um it, it's so the one thing that i was i thought would be might be a challenge in Tustin unified and maybe luckily it's not happening as badly as as what i've heard other other places but some kids that maybe don't still don't have you know internet access or or, or device access at their homes is there a challenge with that in Tustin unified uh, there was a challenge. Uh, we think, as far as we know, uh, everybody has connection now. And the way that happened was uh, before spring break, so it was around March 10th, 11th, 12th, right in there, we sent out a survey to families K-4. Well, I guess that's not true. We sent out surveys K-12, and we said, if we have to do distance learning, do you have a computer or device for the kids to work on at home? And we know the fifth through the 12th graders do because they have the one we've given them. But the K-4 kids didn't all uh, have technology that we've checked out. And some of those families said, no, no, we got a computer. They can just use the computer at home. And then the parents got put on homes, homework. And well, that computer was for the kid, but now that computer is for me. So yeah, we need a computer. So, um, we kept that survey open for probably two weeks and people could go in and say, I need a device or I need a uh, connection to the, the uh, internet. And the service providers like Comcast, or I guess their spectrum now, um, Verizon, all, all the people who provide internet service in our community are doing these deals where they can get the basic free package for the months of the uh, quarantine. Um, a lot of the families that qual qualify for that don't really have the wherewithal or the credit rating to go get it. And so our IT our, our folks actually sat on uh, conference calls with the family and the, the internet service provider individually, one at a time, to get them hooked up. Some of those families had internet connection but didn't pay their bill and then got canceled. And so it took the district's intervention to get them um, connected back to the internet. And in some of those cases where it just, you can't get it for whatever reason, we've purchased, uh, we purchased hotspots um, so that the kids could connect sort of like we do, but through our phones. Um, we bought 200 of those devices because we were limited. The, the, the um, vendors were getting inundated for requests for hotspots. So they were limiting. You can only get 200 at a time. TPSF, Tustin Public Schools Foundation, which is our awesome partner, 
they as a separate entity could qualify for additional devices. So they bought those devices and then we've reimbursed them for that. So we, it, it wasn't an issue that we don't have money for it. We just, we were limited by the vendor and how many you could take at a time. Sort of like you can only buy one roll of toilet paper when you go to the grocery. Um, they, were, they were rationing hotspots. Well, if you run into that again, we can certainly do that with, uh, with the, our Rotary Club Foundation too. We have a, a similar availability for as an organization. Um, yeah, for with, with, with the tech and operating systems, and we have an account with a lot of those organizations. Good call. Yeah, and the district does as well, the Rot Rotary District, I mean. Okay. Thank you, Dick. I, uh, I just can't say enough about the staff at TUSD. It's everybody rolls up their sleeves and jumps in, and we're really proud to serve. Well, thank you. Thank you for the update today, and bringing us all up to date and it's pretty amazing what you all have accomplished in in very short order and it looks like it's a very you know as well as can be expected for what's going on right now and uh, we certainly all commend you for that and as Gary said there's something that the club can do that we can step up to the plate to help out in any way uh, we're here let us know what we can do to help you and know that I, goes for the long term about that is a, a topic dick but I think when we come back to school, you know, a lot of our families, their parents have lost jobs. As we know, unemployment is, is way up. So some of those traditional back to school backpacks, school clothes, I, I can imagine that we're going to have a higher need for those things uh, this okay. fall than we've had in the past. Well, good, good point. And we'll kind of keep that in mind as we look for ways to help out in the community. Are there any other uh, announcements or, or questions? Great. I'd just like to remind you, we're going to continue uh, with our series of uh, updates on how things are going in the community and around the around the area. Our speaker <laughs> next week will be our uh, Leticia Clark, our mayor pro tem, who will talk to us about the city of Tustin and how the, the city has been impacted by this and what plans they have uh, for the city going forward and city services. So that'll be our speaker uh, next week. Uh, Gary, you had something? Well, only that I, I don't want Greg to think that we're real happy with the kids to just be at home. <laughs> <laughs> don't get too comfortable with it. They may be loving the idea of only going to school three hours a day, but, but we don't. <laughs> but, but thank you so much for what you've done. <laughs> okay, I think, uh, are there any other questions uh, or comments for the day? No. Okay, we'll officially adjourn the meeting. Thank you all for attending, and we'll see you again next week. Bye bye, guys. Thanks. Okay. Bye. bye. Good job, Gary and, and Dick. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Hey.